Hello everyone, I am John Allen, the editor of Crux. You can find us online at cruxnow.com. That is cruxnow.com. Also the host of this show, Last Week in the Church. This is the show where we sort of metaphorically raid the journalistic fridge. We're going to take out some news that in some cases is almost a week old. But we're going to throw it into the skillet, spr sprinkle over some spices and our secret Crux brand sauce, and serve it up piping hot. Here's what we've got for you this week. First, rumors of resignation. Pope Francis schedules a day trip in late August, sparking rumors that he might be getting set to resign. We'll explain why it's probably not a good idea to get too far ahead of what we actually know. Second, the summer of suffering. Between now and September, Pope Francis has trips to five different destinations scheduled, three foreign countries and two locations here in Italy. The common thread running through them all is that he will be visiting people who have experienced deep and often forgotten suffering. Christians under fire. Once again, in the African nation of Nigeria, Christians were attacked on one of the holiest days on the Christian calendar, in this case the Feast of Pentecost. We'll explain what's going on. Then, the trial of the century and the ghost of the papal states. The Vatican's current criminal trial involving a $400 million real estate deal in London gone horribly wrong is dragging on, and there does appear to be an eerie parallel to events in the Papal States. We'll unpack. And then, finally, hitting on all cylinders when it comes to HR, the Vatican finally resurrects the long-promised Human Resources Office as part of the Pope's ongoing reform of the Roman Curia. We'll explain why this office, if it actually works, could be the cornerstone to reform. All that and more is waiting for you this week on Last Week in the Church, so please stick around. All right, happy Tuesday to you. Happy June 7th in the year of our Lord, 2022. We begin this week with rumors of resignation. So the Vatican announced over the weekend that Pope Francis is planning to visit the central Italian town of L'Aquila, literally that means the eagle, on August 28th. Now, he's already called a consistory for the creation of new cardinals on August 27th, and he's called a two-day meeting of cardinals to discuss his reform of the Roman Curia August 29th and 30th, so this falls smack dab in the middle. Now, this trip has fueled rumors that the Pope might be getting ready to resign. Why? Well, because L'Aquila is the home of Pope Celestine V, who was the last pope before Benedict XVI to really voluntarily resign. It had happened centuries before, of course. Pope Benedict visited L'Aquila and the tomb of Celestine V in 2009, and of course, four years later, in 2013, he resigned. The fact Pope Francis is going back to that location, that coupled with his recent health struggles because of knee pain, he has been confined to a wheelchair in most of his recent public appearances. This is on top of colon surgery last summer and his ongoing problems with sciatica. The fact that he still has only, that part of one of his lungs is gone because of an operation he had as a young man. All of that has added up to many people speculating that perhaps we are entering the end game of this papacy. Now, here's the thing. First of all, when Pope Benedict went to L'Aquila in 2009, it wasn't because at that moment he knew he was going to resign four years later. It was instead because L'Aquila had been struck by a devastating earthquake that year, 6.3 magnitude earthquake that killed 309 people. And as the primate of Italy, Pope Benedict wanted to express his pastoral concern for the people of that region. And similarly, that's probably the main reason that Pope Francis is going this time. The ostensible motive for the trip is that he is going to be closing a Eucharistic Congress that is taking place in L'Aquila. But beyond that, undoubtedly, he also wants to express his own closeness and concern for the people of this region that were so terribly struck by this awful earthquake. 
And I would point out that the reconstruction, the promised reconstruction by the Italian government of L'Aquila is still a work in progress. In fact, recently it had been put on hold because of the COVID pandemic and because of rising prices of fuel and prime materials. So there are still lots of people in L'Aquila and the surrounding region. And bear in mind, this is only about 60 miles away from Rome. So it's very close to the Pope's own backyard. Still lots of folks there who are displaced, not back to their homes, still suffering the consequences of this awful natural disaster. So the most probable thing is that Pope Francis simply wants to have the opportunity to express his fondness for those folks. The other reason he's going is because this is the beginning of what is known as the Celestinian pardon. This is a plenary indulgence that is the full remission of all sins, which was instituted by Pope Celestine V so many years ago. And for those who visit the Basilica of Santa Maria di Colomaggio in L'Aquila and who perform other pious acts, they can acquire this plenary indulgence, and the Pope wants to go to open the holy door and to declare that this holy year of indulgence open. In other words, it has nothing directly to do with him being ready to step down. I would also point out, as we'll come to in a moment, he has a very busy travel schedule for the rest of this summer. And let's not forget, next year, he has the Synod of Bishops on Synodality, which is a process in which he has invested tremendous personal and corporate resources. A smart money, probably, as the Pope would like to see that to conclusion. My wife and I recently had the opportunity to speak to a senior Vatican official who said that he had recently had a meeting with the Pope, and the Pope ticked off a whole series of projects that he is planning to be involved with. So there was no indication there that he's getting set to walk away. I mean, look, we will see. Pope Francis is a Pope of surprises, has been from the very beginning. It is also true that Pope Francis has lived through not one, but two historic resignations in his ecclesiastical career. He, of course, witnessed the resignation of Pope Benedict XVI that led to his own election. But prior to that, he had witnessed the resignation of Father Hans-Peter Kolbenbach as the superior of the Jesuits. Prior to that, the Black Pope, as the leader of the Jesuits is colloquially known, served for life. And so Kolbenbach became the first one to step down while, you know, he still had possession of his faculties and was not facing a grave threat to his life. And neither the Jesuit order nor the Catholic Church ran off the rails because of these resignations. And so certainly Pope Francis, one would expect, is at least open to that idea. But there's no indication that this particular trip signals that such a resignation is imminent. As always, we will see. All right, second up this week, the summer of suffering. So here's what we know about Pope Francis's travel schedule for the next little while. In July, Early July, he is going to be traveling to the nations, the African nations of South Sudan and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. We know in late July, he is planning to go to Canada, in particular to deliver a long-awaited apology to the indigenous persons of the nations of Canada, whose young people suffer tremendous abuse in church-run residential schools. Then. As we've already mentioned, in August, he's going to be going for a day trip to the city of L'Aquila, devastated by an earthquake. And then in late September, he will be going to the Italian city of Matera. While he was there, he will visit the neighborhood of Isasi. These are ancient neighborhoods in Matera, literally carved out of rock. Now, what is the common thread uniting all of these trips? Well, in many ways, these are all trips in which the local population has experienced tremendous suffering that has, in many ways, been sort of forgotten or ignored by the wider world. I mean, South Sudan fought a decades-long war to achieve its independence from Sudan. And finally, having achieved that independence, the peace has turned out to be a lot less peaceful than people were hoping. Conflict continues to scar the country. Also, poverty is rampant 
the estimate is that more than 80% of the population of South Sudan lives in what the United Nations would consider extreme poverty. The Democratic Republic of the Congo? Well, over the weekend, my wife and I and some friends of ours watched a documentary based on the famous book, King Leopold's Ghost about the legacy of Belgian colonialism in the Congo, arguably the worst, most pernicious, most violent, and most exploitative form of colonialism anywhere in Africa. That legacy is still very much alive. The estimate are, is that somewhere around 75% of the Congolese population lives in extreme poverty. There are whole regions of the country where the government has no effective control Affairs are run by armed bands for whom kidnapping and illegal sales of natural resources are their primary revenue streams. And so Pope Francis obviously wants the opportunity to shine a spotlight on all of that. Also, let's not forget that Congo, by virtue of its population, is one of the powerhouses in Africa. It is destined to be the largest Catholic country in the world in which French is the predominant language in this century. And so its fortunes are obviously tremendously important. Then in Canada, of course, Pope Francis will not only be visiting sort of the conventional locations, but he will also be going to a city in the north of Canada that is 60% inhabited by the Inuit peoples, one of the indigenous groups, whose children were for a long period of time forcibly removed from their homes, lodged in church-run residential schools, and subjected to appalling forms of abuse. That abuse, the revelations about that abuse, have galvanized public opinion in Canada right across the board and created enormous expectations for not only the Pope apologizing, he, he apologized here in Rome. He will deliver a version of that apology again in Canada, but also expectations that the church at long last is going to take strides to do justice to the victims of this abuse, which would include, in the eyes of the leaders of these indigenous groups, opening up its archives so the truth about what happened can be established with historical precision, and also perhaps paying reparation. We will see to what extent the ball is moved on those issues by the Pope's visit, but certainly it will lend momentum to those discussions. Then, you know, we've already explained why the visit to L'Aquila is important. It's the legacy of the 2009 earthquake. In terms of the visit to Matera and the Sassi neighborhoods, it's worth remembering that Matera is in the Basilicata. It's the, the farthest south region in Italy before you move down the heel of the boot and you get to Sicily and so on. Southern Italy is a region that has long suffered in terms of economic and social development. In fact, the famed Italian writer Carlo Levi, who was sentenced to sort of gulag-style prison term in the Basilicata in the 1930s because of his opposition to Italy's fascist regime, wrote a famous book about all that called Christ Stopped at Eboli, which basically is a reference to a phrase that locals in the Basilicata used. Eboli is about 100 miles to the north of Matera. And what they meant was that Christianity never really reached the far south of Italy. For that matter, development, civilization, never really reached the far south of Italy. Poverty rates there historically have been off the charts. Levels of college graduation and all of that are far lower than they are in the developed north of Italy. And so it's another location where Pope Francis has the opportunity to stand with people who have long been left out of the process of development and progress and indicate that the church is for them too. That is, I think, the scarlet thread running through all these trips. By the way, one thing I do want to say about the region of the Basilicata is that it is also known by its ancient Roman name, which is Lucania. And locals are known as Lucani. Now, all of this is important because for many years, my favorite amaro, that's the Italian term for a kind of after-dinner liqueur, 
has been Lucano, which I didn't know until the Pope announced this trip and I did some research. I didn't realize that Lucano was actually developed in a small town in the Basilicata, and it's called Lucano after the name given to locals of that region. Now, of course, it has since gone national and international. It's enjoyed phenomenal success, but its roots are in this forgotten, neglected, and often disadvantaged region of southern Italy. So let me just say this. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to make the Pope's trip to Matera, but I will be drinking a glass of Lucano in his honor while he is there. All right, Christians under fire. So on Sunday, in the southwestern Nigerian state of Ondo, while Catholics gathered for the Feast of the Pentecost, terrorists launched an attack at a Catholic church that left estimates vary because right now we don't know how many people really did because so many of the wounded have been evacuated to hospitals and we're not sure if they're going to survive. But at least 50 people, perhaps as many as 75 or more, were killed in this attack. No group has claimed responsibility for it, but the suspicion is these were radical Fulani herdsmen. The Fulani is a majority Muslim tribe in Nigeria, largely concentrated in the country's north, but they have recently been migrating southward to find grazing lands for their cattle. And Undo State had recently adopted a series of measures basically intended to tell the Fulani, you can't graze your cattle here. So the theory is that this was payback. While the Fulani in general tend to be a very peaceful group of people, there is a small but influential minority within the Fulani who have become radicalized both by what they perceive to be economic oppression by the Nigerian government, but also on the basis of jihadist ideology. And they, in tandem with Boko Haram and other currents of radical Islam in Nigeria, have made targets both of the Nigerian state and also the Christian community in Nigeria. Open Doors International, which is basically, historically, a Protestant watchdog group that tracks anti-Christian persecution, presently lists Nigeria as the seventh most dangerous nation in the world to be a Christian. They also assess that more Christians lost their lives for the faith last year in Nigeria, roughly 4,600, than in any other country in the world. So this most recent attack is simply of a piece with what has been the dominant Christian story in Nigeria for a long time. Now, here's why all of this matters. Aside from the fact that these are innocent people being killed for no other reason than their religious beliefs, which is a human rights outrage, no matter where it happened or no matter who the victims are. But the other reason this matters is that Nigeria has the largest mixed Muslim Catholic population in the world. Nigeria is the most populous nation in Africa. It's getting close to 300 million people by now. And it's roughly half and half, Muslims and Christians. Here's the thing. If Muslims and Christians cannot find a modus vivendi in Nigeria, if they can't find a way to live together in peace and prosperity, then what hope is there for virtually any place else on earth? And so the fate of our brother and sister Christians in Nigeria vis-a-vis -vis this increasingly violent radical Islamic current. That's of interest, again, not merely on a human rights basis, but also because it affects all the rest of us. This is a global security question that deserves far more attention than it's getting. Pope Francis on Sunday, late Sunday, released a statement indicating that while the details of the attack were being sorted out, obviously his prayers are with the victims and with the entire nation of Nigeria. One hopes that going forward that there will be a serious commitment on the part of public authorities in Nigeria and also internationally to giving the country the resources it needs to get this situation under control. Because as I say, as goes Nigeria with regard to Muslim-Christian relations, so goes the rest of the world. All right, we come now to the Vatican's infamous, I guess one could say now, trial of the century. This is the criminal trial 
under the civil laws of the Vatican City State that has 10 individual defendants and a handful of corporate entities in the dock, including for the very first time, a cardinal of the Catholic Church, Italian Cardinal Angelo Becciu, the Pope's former chief of staff. This past week, we heard testimony from a couple of defendants in this trial, one an Italian businessman who was a consultant, the other from another Italian businessman who was sort of the in-house investment banker for the Vatican Secretary of State. Both basically said that the decisions about the London deal were made above their heads, and one of them testified that the deal had been brokered in part by a personal friend of Pope Francis, an Italian healthcare executive by the name of Giovanni Milanese, who Pope Francis knew from his time in Argentina. Milanese, for the record, has not been charged with any criminal offense in this trial. Now, here's why I say this kind of has echoes of the Papal States. Over the weekend, I was rereading a sort of memoir about the Papal States, and among other things, it described an affair that took place in 1857, in which an Italian noble who had been placed in charge of the Monte di Pietà, basically kind of pawnbroker slash lending institution in the Papal States, he was misappropriating funds from this institution in order to finance his purchases of art. Now, this went on with the full approval of the finance minister in the Papal States and a number of other senior officials at the Papal Court. Then, finally, the Secretary of State at the time, Cardinal Antonelli, decided to charge this guy with embezzlement, not really because he was outraged by financial misconduct, but because he wanted to make his own brother the head of the Bonte di Pietà. And so embezzlement was a convenient way to get rid of the guy who currently had the job, right? Now, you know, this trial of the century was supposed to represent a break with those bad old days, right? It was supposed to mean that a new era of transparency and accountability had dawned. And yet, there are nevertheless eerie parallels. I mean, once again, people are being charged with crimes for financial conduct that amounted to common practice in the Vatican, of which everyone was aware. And once again, officials perceived as having the Pope's favor have been exempted from these indictments, whereas people perceived as out of favor with the Pope have been charged. Now, I mean, we will see what happens going forward, but it seems to me the deep lesson in all of this is that if we want to finally lay to rest the ghosts of the Papal States. What is needed is a thorough separation of powers between the executive and the judicial functions in the civil justice system of the Vatican. Because right now, the Pope is head of both the executive branch and the judicial branch, which means, inevitably, the judges and the prosecutors in the judicial system work for the Pope and they are inevitably going to try to do what they perceive the Pope wants, whether or not it's actually what the Pope intends. In other words, the judicial system in the Vatican, inevitably, because of the structural realities, is an extension of politics by other means. And so, to avoid all of this, what will be needed in the future is the creation of an independent civil judiciary in the Vatican that is not answerable to the Pope or any other executive authority, but operates the same way that independent judiciaries do in other advanced democratic states. Pope Francis has already launched a thoroughgoing reform in the Vatican. There's no reason that at some stage this couldn't be folded into it. If that doesn't happen, either under Francis or another pope, then unfortunately we are going to be haunted by the ghosts of the papal states until it does. All right, and then finally this week, here's what we've got. Human resources, okay? Now, you may remember that in 2020, the Vatican, to great fanfare, announced that it was creating a human resources office within the Secretary of State. It was on a Friday. And what they said was, this was a cornerstone of the reform of the Vatican launched by Pope Francis, 
Henceforth, this office will be responsible for supervision and professional development of Vatican personnel. Then on Saturday, so like basically 24 hours later, we got a statement from the Vatican saying, whoops, actually, this office is merely one idea among many, and Pope Francis will decide in due course what to do about it. Well, here we are two years later, and finally, we know what Pope Francis has decided to do about it. There is now going to be, apparently, a human resources office in the Vatican. It's not, however, going to be located in the Secretary of State, but instead in the Secretariat for the Economy, which is currently run by a Jesuit confrere of Pope Francis, Father Guerrero. And he recently sent out a memo inside the Vatican in which he outlined the functions of this new Directorate for Human Resources. According to Father Guerrero, it is going to be responsible for supervising Vatican personnel, for overseeing their ongoing professional development so that they can acquire new skills. It's going to be responsible for instituting a system of merit-based pay raises so that increases in pay would be based on accomplishment, not simply on seniority. And it will also be responsible, again, all this according to, to Father Goretto, for ensuring greater communication among the various Vatican departments, creating opportunities for employees, personnel from various Vatican departments to come together, get to know one another, and to exchange information and coordinate their efforts. Now, Here's the thing. If all of that actually happened, it would amount to an absolute revolution in the internal operations of the Vatican, because I can guarantee you that up to this point, there has been no, I emphasize no, system of professional development inside the Vatican to the extent that anyone acquired additional skills on the job. They did so on their own and on their own dime. I can certainly assure you that there has never been a system of merit-based pay increases. There has never been a system of evaluation of performance. And I can also assure you that the Vatican has been one of the most, oh, I don't know, siloized working environments in creation in the sense that people in one department have no idea what another department is doing. In fact, people who work right down the hall from another office will tell you that they were totally blindsided when they learned that that department was working on something that actually had something to do with what they were working on, and yet neither camp had any idea what the other was doing. So if we do get a system in which there is a real program of professional development, in which there is a real system of personnel evaluation and performance evaluation, and that there are, there are incentives built into the system for exceptional performance. And if we do get greater communication amid the various departments, this could well end up being the most important single reform that Pope Francis has enacted to date. As always, the proof will be in the pudding, right? We will see if this actually works, but at least the design of this new system is enormously promising. Well, Francis's reform of the Roman Curia in his document Predicate Evangelium took effect this only this past Sunday. We're on Tuesday, right? So two days is far too early to evaluate exactly what its impact is going to be. But I will simply repeat, this reform on the human resources front is at least potentially the single most revolutionary element of this entire overhaul and it is going to be fascinating to see how it plays out. All right, that is our show for this week. Thank you for being with us on Last Week in the Church. As ever, you can find full coverage of all these stories on the Crux site, that is cruxnow.com, your one-stop shopping destination for the very best in smart, wired, and independent Catholic journalism. While you're on the site, and please spend bucket loads of time on the site, I promise you, you will not be disappointed, you will find a handy-dandy way to make a financial contribution. Listen, that contribution doesn't simply support the operations of the crux side. It also supports this show. 
because the thing of it is, we got to pay for the studio, we got to pay for our time, we got to pay for the equipment. And if you enjoy the program, we would love it if you could help us keep it going. It doesn't have to be very much, five bucks, 10 bucks, 15, whatever you can afford. But if you could commit to that on a monthly basis, say for the next year, that would be enormously helpful because it would help give us stability, the ability to plan from the bottom of our collective hearts. Thank you in advance if you could see your way clear to doing that. We will see you right here next Tuesday, same bat time, same bat channel. In the meantime, my charge to you is stay safe, stay healthy, have a fantastic and blessed week, and we will talk to you again soon.